Hello everyone, Dr. Anna Kabeca here, The Girlfriend Doctor. Today I am live with Glenn Livingston. We're gonna talk about binge eating, eating disorders, and how never to be victim of this again. And I'm thrilled to bring you here to our audience, Glenn. Thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me here. I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> well, I know you talk to a lot of audiences, a lot of people about this topic. I really want you to tell us your story, your motivation, for 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 getting into this well i suppose the most important thing important thing for you to know is that i'm not just a doctor who decided to work with weight loss patients i'm someone who had a very serious eating problem myself um, I, I offer this as education and training rather than for my license by the way because i don't consider this to be a treatment um you'll see why as we go along but um when i was about 17 I'm six foot four and I'm modestly muscular, just naturally. And I figured out that if I worked out for two hours a week, two hours a day, <laughs> I could eat just about anything I wanted to. Um, you know, whole pizzas or two, boxes of muffins, boxes of donuts, boxes of chocolate bars, whatever you could imagine if it wasn't nailed down. And you got to a 7-Eleven and they were out of pizza or chocolate before you got there. It's probably because I was there just before you. <laughs> and, and, um, and what worked for me when I was 17 really stopped working for me when I was 22 or 23. And my metabolism slowed down a little bit. And I was married. And I was commuting two hours in each direction to see patients and go to school. And then I get home and my wife at the time would want to talk to me. And I just didn't have time to work out. Um, but I found that the food had a life of its own. And so I kept eating five or 6,000 calories a day, even though I wasn't working out the way that I used to. And I got heavier and my triglycerides went through the roof. And the doctors were telling me I was gonna be in a lot of trouble soon. But um, none of that bothered me that much because I, you know, I'm tall and I wore the weight well and I wasn't that fat yet. And what really bothered me was my inability to be present with my clients. If you know much about being a psychologist, it's, it's not a very intellectual pursuit. I mean, you have to know things. You have to study. You have to you know, go through school. But um, it's not like people are showing you the jigsaw puzzle of their life and you say, well, this piece fits over here. And why don't you go do that now? And they say, thanks, Doc. I'll, I'll get right on that. It's more like you have to figure out how to lend them your soul so they can love and trust you enough to think new thoughts and try new things. And I come from a family of 17 therapists. Yeah, my, um, the standing family joke is that if something breaks in the house, nobody knows how to fix it, but everybody knows how to ask it how it feels. So that's, that's how I grew up. Um, but because I, I love it, I love <laughs> it. I can't even imagine. Yeah. Well, at least you have the ability to communicate, obviously. So that, it was a very soulful upbringing. I don't regret it. There, there are some crazy things about it, but I don't. I don't regret it. Um, but but because that was what I always wanted to do, first and foremost. You know, when when I was turning sixteen, all my friends wanted to get a car, and I asked my dad if I could go see a shrink instead because I wanted to get started. You have to really go through your own psychotherapy in order to be a good psychotherapist. So um, what really bothered me was that I would be sitting with my first clients, my first one of the clients, and I would see a couple right after there was an affair or I'd be sitting with a suicidal adolescent. And it was hard for me to be totally there because I'd be thinking, when, when can I go get to the deli? When can I get my next pizza? You know, and, and that was killing me more so than the weight was killing me. Coming from the family that I came from, I went the psychological route. So I went to all the best psychologists and psychiatrists in and around New York City because we knew who they were. And I went to Overeaters Anonymous and I went on a kind of spiritual journey to try to figure out what, what was the hole in my heart? How could I fill the hole in my heart so I'd stop compulsively trying to fill the hole in my stomach? And I learned a lot about myself on that journey. It was a very meaningful journey. I don't regret having done it, but it didn't really work to stop the binge eating. It, as a matter of fact, in some ways it made it worse. I would lose weight for a little bit and then I'd gain even more. Um, at the same time, I, I didn't have kids and I didn't commute. And my, my 
wife was traveling for business at the time. And so I had all this time on my hands and I started a second career as an advertising consultant for the big food and the big pharmaceutical industries. I kind of wish I didn't do that. I feel like I was on the wrong side of the war, um, but I did. And I was one of those hidden persuaders behind the scenes. And I was discovering as we were going along that there are a lot of forces in the big food industry in particular that have nothing to do with having a hole in my heart or needing to nurture my inner wounded child back to health. It's more like they were, they're targeting our reptilian brains. They're trying to hit our bliss points with these hyper palatable food like substances, you know, concentrations of starch and sugar and fat and oil and excitotoxins and salt. And, and it's all designed to hit the bliss point without giving you enough nutrition to feel satisfied with the result of doing that is that you crave more. I, I want to dig into that because we said the marketing behind the madness of food addictions, right? I mean, that's what we're talking about. And it's like creating food uh, foods that are addictive to us that we can't walk by them without grabbing them. And how it's like how they these foods become heroin, not just through the marketing, but through some of the ingredients, the fats, the sugar content um, and flavors that create this addiction. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because this is powerful. Well, yeah, and I, I think that every time you're looking for love at the bottom of a bag or a box or a container, that there's some fat cat in a white suit with a mustache is laughing all the way to the bank. That's that's kind of how I encapsulate what's um, what's going on. So I'll give you an example. I remember a major food bar manufacturer who shall remain, remain nameless so they don't sue me. Okay. Um, I remember the vice president of marketing was about to leave his job and he pulled me aside and he said, I have to tell you something. I got to tell you what the most profitable thing we ever did was. And I don't mean to single this, them out because this goes on all across the industry. He said, we took the vitamins out of the bar and we put the money into the packaging instead. And we made the packaging look vibrant and colorful and shiny because in nature, a diversity of vibrant, shiny colors will signal a diversity of micronutrients that are available. So if you think about eating the rainbow, we're always told to eat the rainbow, make a salad with green lettuce and blueberries and, you know, tomatoes, red, red tomatoes and yellow carrots and you know, purple cabbage. Your, your brain is evolutionarily set up to respond to that because that's how it detects a diversity of micronutrients that are available. But in this case, what they were telling me is that... Um, that, that they, they actually took those vitamins out of the bar and they put the money into the packaging and said they were faking us out. It's kind of like in nature, there are certain examples of parasites. You know, a, a, a um, symbiotic relationship between species and nature is one where both species benefit. A parasitic relationship is one where one species benefits at the expense of the other. So there are these fish. Uh, big fish and a little fish in nature. I forget the name of them. I read it in Robert Cialdini's book. One fish is kind of a big fish and it tends to get a lot of seaweed and things between its teeth. There's this little fish that has a symbiotic relationship with the big fish where it does a little dance in front of the big fish and the big fish goes into a trance and opens its mouth. Uh, it says, come clean my teeth and the little fish comes and cleans the, the big fish's teeth. And that works out for both of them because the little fish gets a meal and the big fish gets its teeth cleaned. But there's this other fish that figured this out. And this other fish is not really interested in cleaning the big fish's teeth. It's interested in eating the big fish's mouth. So it learned how to mimic the dance of the little fish and put the big fish into a trance. And then when the big fish is in a trance, the parasitic fish comes in and basically eats the mouth of the, of the big fish and the big fish stays in the trance while this happens. And there are examples of, of this throughout nature, but when you start to think about what's happening in the advertising industry, that, that's really what they're doing. They, they've learned how to push these evolutionary but buttons and they, they wrench your survival drive away from you and they attach it to these food-like substances. Um, you know, and, and it's... Um, I don't mean to completely blame the industry because consumers want to be lied to. 
they want good news about their bad habits, they'll say, oh, these potato chips have vitamin E or they're made with avocado oil and therefore these are good and healthy, not counting the density of calories or the acrylamide form when the potato chips are grilled or the carcinogenic compounds that are created from heating oil. Um, but you know, it's got avocado oil, so it's got some good nutrients in it, so it's okay. The consumer really wants to be lied to. Uh, but for, from my perspective, in terms of finding a solution, I said, this doesn't have anything to do with whether I've got a hole in my heart or not. This doesn't have anything to do with the fact that I'm in a bad marriage or that you know, my mom didn't love me the right way when I was a kid. This is a very powerful external force. Then they advertise it to you in such a way that you think you really need it to survive. And people think that advertising doesn't affect them, but it actually affects them more when they think it doesn't affect them because that's when your sales defenses are down. So that's exactly where the advertising industry wants you. Um, and so you kind of put it all together and it's a perfect storm to confuse our survival drives, to make us think that we don't really like fruits and vegetables, to get us chasing these bags and boxes and containers instead of um, what nature has to offer. So, or even that the word organic is like a dirty word, right? Like, oh, right. organic? You know, what does that mean, right? Or my mom only makes me eat organic food. I'm like, aren't you lucky? How blessed right. you are, child. Right. Now get in the car. We got to go. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm jealous of kids who were brought up with um with healthy food. My, I don't think I ate a vegetable until I was 21, and my mom always made sure there was a um, big box of chocolate pop tarts and a case of Coca Cola in the closet for me in the morning to to eat. So, yeah, that that was my upbringing. Your teachers must have loved you in the classroom. <laughs> My dentist loved me. It's more like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. I just think about um when I uh you know. Uh, after retiring my clinical practice, being able to attend my daughter's lunches at school and seeing the food that she was eating, like when I didn't pack her lunch. And she'd be, I, I'd be like, okay, let's identify the not food from the food, right? Like a corn dog is not food. Sorry, it's just not right. food. Right. And, and ketchup isn't a vegetable. Ketchup, right. French fries, you know, like what? I, although they are my food addiction. So let's talk. I got immediately into French fries talking to you, Glenn. I'm like, ah. Oh, such a wonderful extra crisp with aioli uh, or peanut sauce. Let me tell you, we've got some good French fries, but creating healthy alternatives are amazing. So being able to substitute those French fries for eggplant fries or something else, um, just creating these great substitutes. Okay. Before I get into all my dietary, um, addictions. Let's talk about this whole concept of binge eating, like how this led, how, how it led to you, how it leads to so many um, eating disorders, and especially this concept of binge eating. And um, that, like you said, just stuffing and, and we do at, at many at can be at any age, right? It's not just a teenage issue, right? The stuffing using food to fill this hole in the heart and to understand you know, to give us the feeling of love and connection. There's a couple of physiologic things on here, which I found was really interesting. Like the ways our body produces oxytocin, digest, uh, um, distension of the stomach. So that binge eating can increase oxytocin by stimulating the vagal nerve. Well, there's that love of eating, right? The physiology is driving the behavior, what will give us this quick fix. And that's, you know, that's not talked about nearly enough. I think it's, you know, that's a fascinating, um, fascinating piece of science behind that. I think there's a fascinating relationship between emotion, emotional trauma, and overeating. And I think that most people misunderstand it. Um, so and I'll, I'll wind this up with a story about a study that I did, and it's something from my own history, which maybe would illustrate the point. But, you know, the nervous system, I, I didn't know that about the oxytocin and the distension of the stomach. That's really interesting. I always learn something on these calls. Um, the nervous system has a difficulty conducting the emotions when the digestive system is overloaded. And as a result, the uh, overeating has a kind of anesthetic effect on the emotions. So people get to not have those uncomfortable feelings or feel them to a lesser extent when they, when they overeat. That's very much true. So people say that they, um, they eat to quote unquote numb out. But I don't think that's the whole story. And I don't think that really describes the relationship completely accurately. I don't think it's the whole story because 
We didn't have chocolate bars on the savannah as we were evolving. There were no Dorito trees. That, that you know, there were no pretzels and pasta and all these things that we all tend to like to, to go for. And these things are supersized concentrations of things that are natural, pleasurable stimuli for us. So we're, we're having our pleasure center stimulated in a way that evolution didn't really prepare us for. What happens when you do that, when you repeatedly present a supersized stimulus, is that your nervous system downgrades its response to it. So if you have a chocolate bar every day, then by the end of about a month, uh, it's not going to taste as sweet to you as it did in the beginning. And you're going to start saying, I don't really want fruit anymore. You know, fruit doesn't taste nat naturally sweet to me. I, I don't even really like vegetables. I can't tell the difference between the different types of lettuce out there. I can't tell the difference between a delicious apple versus a gala apple versus a Fuji apple. And all, all of the natural um, mechanisms in our brain, which are supposed to give us pleasure in response to things that are healthy for us, they they go and, they, and this is why people say that they don't like fruit and vegetables and they they know that if you're going to have if you're going to lose weight at minimum you're going to have to have more vegetables right but most people don't like them anymore um, it's called down regulation thankfully the process also works in reverse so if you stop eating if you stop eating the chocolate bar every day then the apple starts to taste sweeter within like 6 to 8 weeks i think there's research that says that it doubles okay but the numbing out of the emotions is not all that happens. There's a there's kind of a high that you get from the chocolate bar or the pasta or the chips or the you know bags and boxes and containers. Or the bagels. We have a um, friend of ours from Facebook said, I guess bagels are on that food addiction list. I'm guiltily eating one now. I don't eat them often, but if there's a <laughs> bag of them on the counter, I'll eat one a day until they're gone. Yes, bagels are definitely on that list also. On that list also, And sometimes I'll joke with people, I'll say, if they said they're having the bagel to numb out or to comfort themselves, I'll say, well, that's interesting, you're eating it to get numb. When you go to the dentist, does he ever say that he's at a Novocaine and he'd like to inject you with a bagel instead, is that okay? And people always laugh and I say, because there's something more that's going on. You want the high of that, in this case, the concentrated, um, the concentrated starch and source of calories at the bagel bagel represents. But but there's more to it than this. So, so I researched the neurology of food addiction a bit, and I discovered that the part of the brain that really responds to addiction, the part that says just hand over the chocolate and nobody gets hurt, the part that says forget about your diet, forget about all the rules that you made, you know, let's just eat some junk now. We have to have this now Let's just go do it. Like people talk about forgetting all their best laid plans and just moving to a totally different um, perspective on food where they feel like they have to do it. They get a case of the efforts. The part of you that's responsible for that is really part of your survival mechanism. It's, it's in the reptilian brain. And the reptilian brain, what's interesting about the reptilian brain is that when it looks at something in the environment, it doesn't know love. The reptilian brain thinks, do I eat it? Do I meet with it or do I kill it? Eat, mate, or kill. Love came from a later evolved or higher part of the brain. It, if you believe God put it there, it doesn't really matter whether you believe it evolved or not, but it's a, it's a higher part of the brain, the mammalian brain that says, wait a minute, before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, what impact will that have on the people that I love, on my tribe and my family? And then there's an even higher part of the brain and the neocortex, especially the frontal lobe that says, wait a minute before you eat meat or kill that thing, what impact is that going to have on my long-term plans? What impact is that going to have on the kind of person that I want to be in society? What impact will that have on my spirituality, on my music, on my art, on my, uh, on my work, on my colleagues? And so here I am spending 20, 30 years trying to overcome my food addiction by loving myself more. And it turns out the part of the brain that's responsible for fruit addiction knows nothing about love. So that was a clue to me. Then the last thing was, I ran this study and I asked people, I intercepted people who were feeling stressed in some way or another on the internet and they were searching for solutions. And I asked them what they were stressed about 
And I asked them what foods they turned to when they were stressed that they couldn't stop eating. And I saw some kind of interesting correlations. And it's going to lead you to a conclusion which is wrong, and I'll tell you what conclusion I came to instead. The three correlations I saw were that people who struggled with chocolate like me, and I always went to chocolate first, I went to pizza and pasta and everything afterwards, but chocolate was always my first go-to. They tended to be lonely, brokenhearted, or depressed. People who struggled with you know, bagels and breads and chewy, soft, starchy things, they tend to be stressed at home. And people who struggled with chips and pretzels and salty, crunchy things, they tend to be stressed at work. And I thought that was really interesting, and I thought I was going to be onto something. But before I started publishing about it or talking about it publicly, I called my mom, who's also a therapist, and I said, Mom, I've got a chocolate thing, and I just discovered something really interesting. You do too, by the way. She knew she had her chocolate thing. And I said, you know, I am kind of lonely or brokenhearted. I'm not in a great marriage and don't really know what to do about it right now. Um, but how did this pattern get set up? There must be something in my history. There must be some way that I was brought up with, you know, food instead of love. And she gets this really horrible look on her face and she says, I'm so sorry, Glenn. And I said, mom, it, it's okay. Whatever it is, it's 40 years ago. I, I love you. I forgive you. Um, I just, I'm trying to figure this out. And she says, I'm so sorry. But when you were one year old in 1965, your dad was a captain in the army and they were talking about sending him to Vietnam. And I was terrified. We were trying to get pregnant with your sister. I thought I'm going to have two little kids. I'm going to be an army widow. I was just terrified. At the same time, your grandfather, my dad, just got out of prison and he was guilty. And I had no idea. I was idolizing him my whole life and I was incredibly depressed. So half the time when you came crawling up to me wanting to be loved or cuddled or played with or even fed some healthy food, I just didn't have the wherewithal to give it to you because I was sitting and staring at the wall feeling anxious and depressed. And so what I did was I kept a big bottle of chocolate Bosco syrup in a refrigerator on the floor. And I said, Glenn, go get your Bosco. And you go crawling over to the Bosco and you take it out and you'd suck on the top and you go into a chocolate sugar coma. And see, if, if this was a movie, at this point, mom and I would have a big cry and a big hug and I'd never have trouble with chocolate again, right? Well, it was a very good conversation to have. We could forgive each other. We, we could, um, I learned a lot about her during that time. I started being softer on myself. The self-hatred did lighten up at that point. So it was a good conversation to have. But my chocolate eating got worse and my binging got worse. Yeah, that's interesting. It seems like the opposite would happen. It seems like the opposite would happen. And this really illustrates the relationship, I think, between emotion and overeating. The reason my chocolate eating got worse is that there is this little voice inside of me that said, you know what, Glenn, you're right. Our mama didn't love us enough and she left a great big chocolate-sized hole in your heart. And until you can figure out this marriage or get out of the marriage and find the love of your life, you're going to have to go right out eating chocolate. Yippee, let's go get some right now. So it became this voice of justification. And at that point, I started to think of the emotion more like a fire in a fireplace, right? Like a roaring fire in a fireplace. And I thought if there were a well-contained fireplace, that roaring fire is an asset, not a liability. Because it can't get out and people gather around it and tell stories and they hug and they cry and they kiss and they make memories and they laugh. But if there's even one hole in the fireplace, it doesn't even matter how big the fire is, one ash can get out and burn down the house. And so I started to think about the problem being that voice of justification that was poking holes in the fireplace that said, yes, you know, well, poor Glenn, you have this hole in your heart and you really deserve some chocolate. Or, you know, you worked out hard enough, you can get away with it, you can start again tomorrow, yippee, let's go do it. Or, you know, chocolate grows on a cocoa bean and therefore it comes from a plant and therefore it's a vegetable. All, all those crazy justifications in my head and this is, what, this is where I did something a little crazy, and I wasn't going to publish at this point. I figured this is just for me to experiment with. I decided that that reptilian brain, I was going to call it my inner pig. I, I wish I had a different name for it, but that's what I called it. You, you don't have to call it that. You can call it your food monster or something like that. But I called it my inner pig. And I would draw a very clear, bright line, like um, 
I will never have chocolate on a weekday again. And then if I heard that voice in my head that said, you could just start tomorrow, I'd say, wait a minute, that's not me. That's my inner pig. My pig is squealing for pig slop. Chocolate is pig slop during the week. I don't eat pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. And as crude as that sounds for a sophisticated psychologist like me, um, as, as primitive as it was, that's what started to wake me up at the moment of impulse and give me those extra microseconds to make the right choice if I wanted to. And I can't say I immediately always made the right choice, but it eliminated that sense of confusion and eliminated that sense of powerlessness. And over the next year or so, combined with um, an understanding of what was going on in the food industry and that I was going to have to wrestle myself away from some of these industrial just really process foods and move towards more, you know, organic whole plant foods for me. Other people do it differently. Um, my program is totally diet agnostic. You use whatever, whatever philosophy you want to. Um, but combined with that, I, I got better. It's, it's like I became, instead of trying to nurture my inner wounded child back to health, I decided I was going to, come, going to become the alpha dog, the alpha wolf in the pack. And that when I was challenged for leadership, I was going to stop saying, oh my goodness, someone needs a hug. And I was going to say, get back in line or I'll kill you. I was going to growl and snarl and basically just take charge of the situation like an alpha wolf would, or like we do with other impulses. You know, when we have other biological impulses, we don't let ourselves be slaves to them. If I had to pee really badly right now, I would still finish the interview first. I would tell my bladder, I'm sorry, I'm in charge. I have, I'm otherwise committed at this time. I've got other obligations and there's a type of person I want to be a responsible person and I want to keep my obligations to Dr. Anna. So we're going to wait. Um, we have biological urges from our reproductive organs, but I don't go running up in the street and kiss people, right? I don't kiss attractive strangers in the street. There's a time and a place to, to do that in a way to approach. And I, I actually, um, I'm kind of shy, so I don't even do that, <laughs> but, 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 um, but the point is that we live very comfortably with these urges and we take charge of them. And I decided that the urge to overeat could be no different. So that's my story. I got better slowly. I lost about 80 pounds. Um, my triglycerides went down, my rosacea and eczema and psoriasis went away. And um, now I'm this psychologist who walks around saying, I don't eat pig slop and I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. Uh, I think that's powerful. I mean, again, understanding. I think it's an issue so much for so many of us, this binge eating. And you talk about ways to categorize it in four categori categories, right? Like how do we now heal from this binge eating, from the need to use food, to have food as an excuse for not feeling good, not feeling good? Well, I, I discovered there were four types of rules you could make. And you, you had to draw a uh, you have to paint a target for yourself. Otherwise, you can't tell when the pig is squealing versus your own healthy thoughts. Look, you need to know what to aim for. Otherwise, you're going to hit something else. So I discovered there were rules where you could give things up, like, you know, I will never eat sugar again or something like that. But I didn't always want to be that strict. So there were conditional rules where it would say, I will only ever have sugar on my birthday or you know, Christmas, New Year's, and, and Thanksgiving, um, or I'll only ever eat pretzels in a major league baseball park, or only ever have bread once per calendar week when two servings at a restaurant, or something like that. And I experimented with a lot of those kinds of rules. So there were never rules where you gave up something. There were conditional rules where you moderated things. There were things you would always do, like um, I always put my fork down between bites I always take a breath before a meal. I always write a hypothetical food plan for myself before I go to bed. I'm not saying everybody needs to do these rules. I'm just giving you examples. And then I discovered it was good to use unconditional rules also. So you thought through for yourself what you could have at any time in unlimited amounts. Uh, so some people, for some people, that's just coffee and water. For other people, it's you know, like unsauced green vegetables or steamed broccoli or something like that. So those were the four categories. Um, but as a practical matter, when I get people started, I say, just pick one rule. If there were, what is the smallest thing that you could and would do that wouldn't feel like too much of a burden, but would turn the ship around? Like I knew this trucker 
and he had about 200 pounds to lose. And he said, I'm not giving up any particular food because I have to eat at these truck stops all day long. What, what he did instead is he said, I'll never go back for seconds. And that started him in the right direction and he eventually lost 150 pounds, um, all starting with that one simple rule. So look, what's the smallest, simplest thing you could and would do? The, a line that you could draw in the sand so that you knew any thought in your head that suggested that you cross it was not you, but it was your food monster or your pig or your reptilian brain. And then when you hear that, that's a sign that your lower brain is getting activated. So you want to do things that take you back into your upper brain. When the lower brain is activated, our sympathetic nervous system is revving us up for action. It perceives there to be an emergency. It's part of the feast and famine response. It's part of the fight or flight response. And so one of the things you can do, you can say, wait a minute. I made a rule about this. I don't really know what's going on right now, but I'm just going to take a breath. And if you breathe in for a count of seven and you breathe out for a count of 11, you're going to slow yourself down a little bit. You're going to activate your parasympathetic nervous system, which says rest and digest. And you can probably do a better job explaining this than, than I could. But you take yourself out. And you carry around something to write with. And you like a piece of pen and a paper or a smartphone. And then you write down what your pig is saying, what your inner food monster is saying. Why do you want me to eat this pig? Why do you want me to eat this food monster? So let's say I say that I'm never going to eat chocolate on a weekday again, but it's Wednesday and I'm at Starbucks and there's a big hairy chocolate bar with my name on it at the counter. Um, and the voice I hear in my head that says, you can just start tomorrow. You worked out hard enough. It doesn't make a difference. It's just as easy to start tomorrow, which is tempting. Well, so I write that down and then I say, why is the pig wrong? How is it lying to me? It's usually a half truth and a, and a bigger lie. Well, it turns out if you look it up that by the principles of neuroplasticity, what fires together, wires together. If you have a craving and you indulge that craving right now, you're going to make that connection stronger. So tomorrow you're gonna to be uh, you're going to be more addicted than you are today. It's going to be harder for you to start tomorrow. If you're in a hole, stop digging. And so you write that down. And then you ask yourself, well, how would resisting the pig make me a happier, better person right now? Well, for me, I want to feel confident that I can walk in the world as a relatively thin man who's um, you know, a, a leader and able to uh, walk, a, able to enjoy my life without the worry about heart attacks and strokes and cardiovascular disease. And I want to be able to climb mountains and spend more time on top. And I want to look handsome. And so I have a whole list of things that come back to me at that moment. If I've done this correctly, the urge is no longer bothering me. And then I say, well, what do I really need? Am I hungry? Am I genuinely hungry? Maybe I'll make myself a banana kale smoothie, or maybe I just need a salad. You don't have to starve yourself but you don't want to break your rule. And so starting with one simple rule, I have people follow that pro process and practice disputing the pig until they um, feel like they have control. And then we move on. I think this is so powerful. Yeah, th this is just, so. there's so much power in this and just analyzing the reasons behind why we're doing this, where it can feel like self-sabotage or, Oh, I, I, I'm weak again. We have to recognize that there's a neurological connection with a behavior and a thought that has has triggered this response. So you have to break that cycle. You absolutely have to break that cycle. Often just saying, okay, I'm, I'm not doing this. I mean, that's definitely a powerful step, but preparing our bodies physiologically not to do it. So, you know, I, I, physiology drives behavior and behavior can shift physiology. So recognizing that and then doing things for our, our audience, it's keto green, the healthy fats and intermittent fasting will create a physiology that helps us resist these cravings more. But then when we have those moments where we're off the wagon, so to speak, how do we reframe those off the wagon moments that we are able to look back into that and see the underlying reasons why this connection or that first glass of wine led to a second glass of wine or that first bite of chocolate led to a second um, box of chocolate and, and how that triggers this binge. Okay. So 
the short answer is you want to collect evidence of success no matter what happened. So did you have five cupcakes instead of 15 cupcakes, right? Did you, um, did you have breakfast, but you skipped lunch? And that's what set you, that's what set you up. Did you binge for two hours instead of two days? What, what evidence of success can you collect? Because if you collect evidence of success, you're going to start to develop a success identity, no matter how small it is in the beginning. So that's, that's the first part of it. The other thing is to understand is that that voice of self-hatred after we binge, the, the self-castigation, that, that self-critical voice that seems to pound the gavel and just not let go after we binge. If you understand that that's coming from the reptilian brain and its purpose is to make you feel too weak to resist the next binge, that it's binge motivated in and of itself, it'll be hard to continue to yell at yourself. And if you refuse to yell at yourself, it's hard to continue to binge because you're, you're cultivating self-esteem, you're cultivating confidence. And a lot of self-esteem and confidence comes from your ability to be a master of your own impulses. If um, to help people to do that, it's helpful to understand that there is a purpose of guilt and shame in the human psyche. There is a constructive purpose, but it's only to produce a moment of pain. The same way if you accidentally back into a hot stove and you touch the hot stove with your hand, you're supposed to jump up in pain and say, oh my God, how did I do that? How am I going to fix it? You're not supposed to put your whole hand down on it and say, oh my God, I'm a pathetic hot stove toucher. I might as well just burn my whole hand, right? You, you use that pain for the moment to get your attention. Once it has your attention, then you figure out what you did wrong. How are you going to adjust so it doesn't happen again? And after that, let it go. Let it go. There's no purpose to guilt afterwards. You want to recommit to your target. Um, I tell people the, the mantra to think of at, this, at these times is to commit with perfection, but forgive yourself with dignity. Think about an Olympic archer aiming at the bullseye. The Olympic archer, when they're aiming at the bullseye, they're not thinking, maybe I'll hit it, maybe I won't, even though they don't always hit it. They're purging their mind of doubt and insecurity. And as they're aiming, they're becoming one with the target. And they can almost see the arrow going into the target before they let it go. And then they analyze, they make adjustments, and they do it again. So that's, that's the attitude of winners. One more thing to help you with these times is the, the squeal that typically gets people the most is that you're a failure, you never stick with things, you failed a thousand times before, how can you possibly expect to do better this time? You're gonna, you're gonna fall down eventually no matter how hard you try. And I could tell you that you would never talk to your kid like that. You know, when your kid is learning how to walk, do you just say, oh, you fell down too many times, forget about it, you might as well just crawl the rest of your life. Nobody does that. I can tell you that if you are on a highway and you fail to take an exit for a thousand miles, you could still take the next one. You don't have to keep driving in the wrong direction. And um, I forgot the third thing I wanted to tell you. It was really important. Hmm, I might have to come back to it. I'm sorry. No, oh, that's that's good. Oh, oh um, I got, I got it, I got it. The third, the third thing is that. The research on permanent weight loss, people who lose it and keep it off for five years, as opposed to those who yo-yo up and down, shows that one of the key distinguishing factors between those two groups are that people who lose weight and keep it off have many more failed attempts behind them. So the path to success seems to run through repeated failure. So the more repeated failures you have behind you, the more likely this failure is going, this, this attempt is going to succeed. It's the opposite of your pig's logic that says you failed so many times before, therefore you'll fail again. No, you failed so many times before, therefore more, you're more likely to succeed now because you have more experience behind you. I That reminds me of a quote I just pulled up yesterday. I'm gonna pull it back up. It's by Paulo Coelho, one of my favorite authors, author of The Alchemist. And he said, the secret of life though is to fall seven times and to get up eight times. Yeah, I like yeah, that. Fall, fall, seven, fall seven times, get up eight. That's a Japanese proverb. 
Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And one thing that um, you said, you said, commit with perfection. What's that quote again? Commit with perfection and forgive yourself with dignity. See, most people say, well, I'll just do the best I can. Progress, not perfection. But that's not really the psychology of how winners win the game. That, that Olympic archer is not saying, I'll just do the best I can. Maybe I'll hit it. Maybe I won't. Even though they know that's true. They're, they're committing with perfection at the moment that they're aiming at the bullseye, but they forgive themselves with dignity. They don't, if they miss the bullseye, they don't say, oh my God, I'm a pathetic archer. I might as well shoot the rest of the arrows just up into the air, right? They, they analyze what went wrong they make adjustments and they commit with perfection again. Pro progress, not perfection, when it comes to a commitment tool for food, really just means I'll try for a little while until I don't feel like it anymore. Oh, and, and the, the, um, my way of saying fall down seven, get up eight, is that the name of the game is staying in the game until you win the game. The name of the game is staying in the game until you win the game. I like that. Yeah, no, thank you. Glenn, tell, I, I appreciate talking about this because I think that sometimes we, I, I talk about the cycle of getting keto green, 10% fasting, 80% keto green, 10% feasting. And many times it's worrying that feasting is binging. So I wanted to bring up this topic and also to give grace around it and, and all the discovery process to looking inside our shadows. I had a lovely podcast earlier today that I recorded with Sarah Ann Livingston on self-love and self-sabotage, right? They sometimes are so intertwined. And these loving, um, these things we do that we think are, are loving, like we get love from eating this chocolate or love from, you know, this feast of, of some sort and is, is sabotaging ourselves. So being able to course correct with grace and dignity is, you know, a process for life and to be free to actually allow to get free from this cycle. Yeah, and the piercing insight to overcome that is that it's difficult to keep binging if you refuse to keep yelling at yourself. If that's the only thing people remember from this interview, then I would be happy. Ah, say that again. It's difficult to keep binging. If you refuse to keep yelling at yourself. If you refuse to keep yelling. I right. like that. So you're, that you're, cut, you're cutting out a little bit. I know my audio, I think my internet's been a little bit challenging. I thank everyone for listening today and for being with us and, um, you know, digging into this sensitive topic. I mean, it's not a comfortable topic for so many people, but it is a very common thing. It's a very, very common thing. So this concept of for, forgiving ourselves and stop yelling at ourselves and recognizing, look for the why in it. Is that correct, Glenn? Um, it's... It, it, I, I would agree with 80% of what you said, and I would alter the look for the why part of it. Um, the why you want to think of is, why do I want to build a brighter future with food for myself? What's it going to do for me to eat well? If I could eat perfectly for a year, what would happen? Those are the kind of whys you want to think about. When you ask yourself, why can't I stop eating? You're programming your brain to look for evidence that you can't stop eating. And if you look for evidence that you can't stop eating, you'll find it. So you'll start to build a, a failure identity. So a lot of people come to me, the first thing they say is, I just want to know why I can't stop eating. And I'll say, well, I'll tell you the first thing is you got to stop asking that question. Um, so I, I, I think that the why of it is interesting. Maybe after you've stopped eating, you'll know why. Maybe you'll have these conversations with your mom like I had with my mom. Um, but how can I stop eating? How can I stop over it? How can I use the present moment to be healthy? That's the question you always want to ask yourself. No matter what happened five seconds, five minutes, or five days ago, how can I use the present moment to be healthy? Because that's all we have is the present moment. I like that approach. How can I use the present moment to be healthy? And um, I, I love this conversation. I know we can continue talking about it for sure, but tell our listeners how to get a hold of you and your teachings and your book. You have a great offer for our audience. Well, if you go to neverbingeagain.com and click the big red button, I'll give you a couple of things. 
One is a free copy of the book in Kindle, Nook, or PDF format. Uh, we do have paperback and Audible, but there's a charge for those. But Kindle, Nook, and PDF are free. Neverbingeagain.com, click the big red button. The two other things you'll get are a set of food plan starter templates, just sets of rules so you can see examples of how you would, for example, frame a keto greens diet or how you would frame a... Um, you know, macrobiotic diet or it really whatever dietary philosophy you want to follow, point counting, calorie counting, it's all, it's all there. And then I know this is a really weird thing to listen to. Like, why does, why does Dr. Anna have a psychologist on with a pig inside of him? Um, so it sounds kind of harsh in the abstract. So I recorded a whole bunch of full-length coaching sessions. They're all free, and you'll get to listen to those also. Just go to neverbingeagain.com, click the big red button, and sign up for the reader bonuses. Uh, thank you. Uh Thank you for everyone for listening and being with us today. So neverbingeagain.com and continue to share this episode and start the conversation. I mean, we talk about accepting where we are, being present and communicating. So this is a start by, by just taking what is from this audience, think from this lecture, from this discussion, think what is my next right step? What is the one next right step? What's the one thing I can take from this and apply to my life? And let's do it. Let's do it together. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>